pick back up with 2230, which is where we um, dropped off the other day. Remember, right around line 2200 or so, beginning around 2200 or so, um, we find out Heloch has died, his son Hardred becomes king, and in less than 10 lines, we go from he Hardred being king to 50 years go by, or to Hardred dying, Beowulf is made king, 50 years go by, so now Beowulf is a really old man, because we don't know how old he was when he fought Grindel. He was anywhere possibly from as young as 20, I don't think so, but to as old as possibly 50. And now, however long Hardred ruled, we don't know, however long Helak continued ruling after Beowulf came back from the fight with Grindel, we don't know how long that was, right? But now 50 years go by. So Beowulf has been king for 50 years. Dragon awakes because some guy gets into the dragon horde and steals a cup. Okay? And picking up right around 2230, 2235, we're told that in this dragon horde there's all kinds of riches. And 2236 tells us why. In earlier times, death had seized them all. And he who still survived, alone from that nation's army, lingered there a mournful century, expected the same, that he might enjoy those ancient treasures for just a little while. And you have the beginning of what is usually called the lay of the last survivor. The last guy of his tribe, his kingdom, his race, whatever you want to call it. Okay? A waiting barrow stood in an open field near the ocean waves, new on the cape, safe with narrow, crafty, crafty narrow entrances. He bore within the noble wealth the plate of gold, that guardian of rings, blah, 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 blah. So, one guy survives of his entire tribe, and he takes all the gold of the tribe and puts it <coughs> essentially in a burial mound. All right? And he speaks these words, because you know everybody on the Beowulf likes to have an opportunity to give a speech. Hold now, O earth, for heroes cannot. The wealth of men. Lo, from you long ago those good ones first obtained it, meaning they dug you out of the ground. Death and war and awful deadly harm have swept away all of my people who have passed from life and left the joyful hall. He's the only one alive, kind of like the wanderer, okay? Now have I none to bear the sword, to burnish the bright cup, the precious vessel. All that host has fled. Now must the hardened helm of hammered gold be stripped of all its trim. The steward's sleep, who should have tended to this battle mask, so too this warrior's coat, which waited once the bite of iron over the crack of boards. And notice, all the things he's talking about are exactly like the things the wanderer talks about. Okay? Back in that poem, when the wanderer... Um, when the poet gives us the ubi sunt motif, where now is the horse, where is the rider, where is the mailed cup, where is, you know, all that kind of stuff. The coat of mail cannot travel widely with the war chief beside the heroes. Why? Because he's dead and gone, and the mail shirt stays behind. All right? So, notice how he concludes that little speech. Savage butchery has sent forth many of the race of men. You fight and you die, and that's it. So, grieving, he mourned his sorrow, alone after all. Unhappy sped both days and nights until the flood of death broke upon his heart. So notice, he dies. What's the very next half line? An old beast of the dawn found that shining horde standing open. An old beast of the dawn means a dragon. Okay. Now there is one Anglo-Saxon scholar, died several years ago, named Raymond Tripp, who argues that the dragon doesn't come from outside. Ray Tripp argued that the dragon was the last survivor transformed. That the guy essentially knows he's going to die, and he lays down to die on this pile of gold. And he's turned into a dragon. 
in Norse material, that's exactly what happens with the individual who becomes the dragon Fafnir. A guy lies down on a treasure hoard and turns into a dragon. And if any of you have read C.S. Lewis, you're familiar with Voyage of the Dawn Treader, yeah, Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where it happens to Eustace, or useless, as I like to call it. Okay? So the dragon comes in. It is his nature to find a hoard in the earth where ancient and proud he guards heathen gold, though it does him no good. Okay? Notice, it's his nature to find gold and do what? Protect it, hoard it. Okay? What have we been told so far, all throughout the poem, in terms of human responsibility and action, as far as gold is concerned? You give it away. You give it away. The king who hoards gold is the bad king, the harem. Okay? So, 300 winters that threat to the people held in the ground is great treasure. The dragon, and pretty much common standard practice, standard operating procedure, you would say, for all dragons. They find a hoard of gold, they go in, they lay down on it, and they and they just sleep. If nobody bothers them, they just sleep. Right? Until one man made him boil with fury. He bore to his liege lord the plated cup. The one man, the thief who breaks into the dragon's barrow, steals the cup and takes it to his lord to essentially buy off his freedom. Okay? And what happened? Then the dragon stirred, and strife was renewed. He slid among the stones. He finds the footprint of the enemy, that is the thief. Thus can, like 2291, thus can an undoomed man easily survive a wreck and ruin. In other words, if it's not your time to die, you're not going to die. If he holds to the ruler's grace of protection, the horde guardian searched along the ground, What's he do? He keeps circling his cave all around the outside, but no one was there. So if the mound looks like this, let's say, and it's got an opening, sorry, opening is actually, yeah. And the dragon comes out, and so now you're looking at the mound from the top. The dragon comes out of the mound, and he starts doing this. And what do you see? Nothing. So what does he do? He takes to the air. And here's exactly what I think he does. I think he follows the same pattern. Only now, what's he doing? You know, spewing flame. He's going to torch everything. All right? So, fit 33. Then that strange visitor began to spew flames and burn the bright courts, etc., etc. To Beowulf 2324, the news was quickly brought of that horror. That his own home, the best of buildings, had burned in waves of fire, the gift throne of the gates. To the good man that was painful in spirit, greatest of sorrows. Now we'll look at what the poet tells us. The wise one believed he had bitterly offended the ruler of all, the eternal Lord, against the old law. Beowulf assumes that the dragon has come. Why? To punish him. But the dragon has come because he, Beowulf, has done something against God. What does Hrothgar assume when Grendel starts to come? Does he? Does Hrothgar and his advisors ever suggest, oh, we've sinned against God? No. In fact, who do they turn to? The soul slayer, or what's called the Gostbona in Anglo-Saxon. It's only Beowulf that says, not, why me, God, but what have I done to offend you? Right? And notice we're told it's against the old law that Beowulf had broken some old institute that God set down. 
His breast within groaned with dark thoughts. That was not his custom. In other words, this is kind of a new experience for Beowulf. He's never really been depressed. He's never really been down before. He's never really wondered, what have I done that was wrong? Okay. So what does he do? Does he sit down in ashes and sackcloth and go, why me? Like Hrothgar did. No. Because Beowulf's a man of action. So, he orders his men to find out the fire flyer, and he orders a new shield to be made. Line 2341. The long good nobleman had to endure the end of his lone days, this world's life. Okay, how many more lines are there before you get to the end of the poem? Almost 900. 3,281 lines in the poem. We're at 2341. Okay. Almost 900 lines. What has the poet just told us? Bill's going to die. Well, whatever happened to the good poetic idea of suspense? He's just told you what's going to happen. It's like you go and see a movie, a two and a half hour movie, and you know at an hour and a half or hour and 45 minutes into it, what's going to happen at the end. Anglo-Saxons didn't care about suspense. It wasn't a, a technique that appealed to them. Okay? Because we're told not only Beowulf's going to die, but so is the dragon. Though he had held for so long his hoarded wealth. So, Beowulf, we're told, scorned to seek out the dragon with his full force of men, a large army. He doesn't get his whole army up. No. Because he doesn't worry about that attack. After all, he killed Grindel. He killed Grindel's mother. Before them, he took on a race of giants. He slew giants. He took on... He's a monster killer. What's a dragon? So... We're told they're 2350 to the end, you know, because Beowulf's thinking, I killed Grindel, I cleansed her up, it's not a problem. Line 2350B, it was not the least of hand to hand combats when Heolac was slain. What? I thought we were getting ready for the dragon fight. What does the poet now do? Yeah, meanwhile, over 50 years ago, or 75 years ago, However long it was, when the king of the gates in the chaos of battle, the lord of his people in the land of the Frisians, the son of Hrethel, died sword drunk. Meaning, drunk with swords. He drank them in. His body took a lot of sword blades. Right? Beowulf escaped from there through his own strength. This is the... I think reference to the Frisian raid, either the second or third, all right? And Beowulf escaped from there. How did he escape from there? Line 2360, he took a long swim. Well, how long? If you look at that map that I gave you, okay, it's kind of over here. Beowulf and the gates are down here in the southern tip of Sweden. So how, how long a swim? He jumped into the North Sea. He swam around Denmark and southern Norway okay, to get back over to the land of the States. Long swim. But he, you know, he didn't put on his Michael Phelps Speedo. Because what was he swimming with? 30 suits of armor. How? <laughs> and one, you know, suits of armor, maybe he's carrying them in one hand and the other hand. What is that line supposed to convey to us? This isn't something anybody else could Even though there are some Old English critics, major scholars, who say, oh, no, 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 no. What we have to understand is that this is a quote-unquote miraculous occurrence. Merely what the Old English poet means to say is Beowulf rode home. He was in a little boat. He put the suits of armor in a little boat, and he rode home. Even though the old English text says he rode with his arm. 
which most people take that to mean swam. Okay. So way back with suits of armor of 30 men. Okay, so now Helak has died. Beowulf gets back home. Helak's wife is still around. Okay. And we're told the son of Edgedale crossed the vast sea and Hig offered him the horde and the kingdom, rings and royal throne. And there are some critics who want to say, well, when Hig offered him the throne and the kingdom, she was really offering him a little bit more than that. She was off herself. But the poet makes clear Beowulf doesn't accept the offer. Okay? What does he do? He says no. But he will stand behind Hardred and flex his muscles so that everybody realizes Hardred has a protect protector. We don't know how old he is at this point. He could be nine. He could be 29. Okay? So, while Hardred is king, we're told, 2379, wretched exiles, the sons of Ultra. these two, right, sought him out across the seas. The him there is Hardred. So, they, and they take refuge in the land of the gates. Now, the sons of Ultra, okay, these guys are sweet. These are gates. <clears throat> Take them out of the gates to see. Why? Because they have rebelled against the Shilving's ruler. The best of all sea kings. Well, who's the ruler? Onola. Wait a second. Ultra is the eldest. So how does he become king? Basic law of primogeniture. Okay. If the father dies, the eldest born son is next in line. Not the brother. That's why, you know, really suck the brother of the one in power. You know, if, if Queen Elizabeth died today, and somebody took out Charles, okay. Prince Andrew would not become the king. Prince Andrew just, you know, is screwed. The king, William. Unless somebody takes out William, and then Harry becomes king. Okay. You take out Harry and William, go to Andrew. Okay. That's the only way that kind of works. So... Something has happened to Ultra. And the Norse sources tell us Onola killed him. Do you remember that fourfold Germanic ethic? First part, duty to one's lord. When Onola kills Ultra, Ultra is his lord. So what do we have here in Beowulf? Think of a modern Disney film. 1994, 1990, no, earlier than that. 1992. The Lion King. Also known as Hamlet. Revisited. It's Claudius. It's Hamlet Sr. It's Hamlet Jr. We just renamed them. Scar, Mufasa, and Simba. Thank you. Okay. So, same kind of paradigm. All right? So, these two, fleeing their uncle, why? Because they fell against them. Because he's taking the kingdom from them. They flee over here to Hardred. So they're like Tony Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I just saw you know, Cameron and Nathan Lane. It doesn't work. Okay, so. Now, um, in that same passage. Look at how Onola is described. The best of all the kings. Okay. Who dispensed treasure in the Swedish lands. A famous king. Now it seems to me that the poet. To his audience. You all know who I'm talking about. Okay. 
That cost him his life. The him? Mordred. Old English is notorious for really never making absolutely clear who the pronouns refer to. Okay? It cost him his life. For his hospitality, that is Hardred's hospitality, he took a mortal hurt with the, sword, with the stroke of a sword, that son of Helak. The son of Onyanthiao, Onala, afterwards, went to seek out a... Okay? So, Onala doesn't just send off others to do his dirty work. He does do that. But he comes also. So what we have is we have Onala and this guy, Westheim. Okay? They come over to the land, and Onala, probably personally, X's out, okay, Hardred. Okay. And Hardred, just one second, Brian. And Hardred, and look at line 2389. And let Beowulf hold the high throne through the gates. That is, Onala, let Beowulf hold the high throne and rule the gates. Now, if somebody lets you do then what does that say about your relationship? You're in debt to them. Are you equals to them? No. They're in power over you. They have authority over you. Okay? So if Onala let Beowulf hold the throne, what does that mean? He is superior to Beowulf. He's more powerful than Beowulf. Beowulf has the strength of 30 men in each. Why doesn't he kill Onala? After all, duty to avenge one's lord and kin. He, Hardred is Beowulf's cousin. Okay. In strictly speaking fashion, Beowulf should have killed Onala then and there. But he doesn't. When I raised this point on an international Anglo-Saxon listserv about Sheesh, Fifteen years ago, I mean, talk about needing to put on a suit of armor. Because people came out of the, how dare you cast dispersions on Beowulf's noble, heroic character. You know, it's not me, it's what the text says. Since then, a couple of other people, have, and one or two of them being major Beowulf scholars, like one guy, um, Andy Orchard, who's one of the top five Beowulf scholars in the world has included this exact same idea in his book, Critical Companion to Beowulf. Nobody, you know, says, well, Andy, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> right? So Beowulf doesn't... You had a question. Um, Westen, is he related to Homer, or just like a mother? Thane. He's not related. Weston and Beowulf are actually related. <coughs> They are all way moon beings. Okay. <coughs> Which are not Swedes, <laughs> and they're not Geats. They're another tribe entirely. Westland's essentially a hired gun. Mercenary. That's what the Germans were known for. I mean, the Romans hired German troops back in the Roman Empire to fight their really bad battles. Because the Germans, everybody knew, were fearless. I mean, keep coming. Even though they're getting slaughtered. The Romans at least realized, run away, run away. You know, fight another day. Kind of. Right? So, all the killed. And then he allows Beowulf to hold the throne. And rule the gates. 2390B. That was a good king. Now, I would say probably... 80 to 90 percent of Anglo Saxon scholars or Beowulf scholars, that was a good king, refers to Beowulf. I, and about 10 percent, say, no, it doesn't. It's referring back to Onala. Okay? That the poet is really praising Onala. Why? This guy gets the job done. He doesn't put it down. You know, you rebel against him, he's going to hunt you down and kill you like shield at the beginning of the book. Well, 
in later days. We don't know how long, but in later days, he did not forget his fall. Who's the he? Beowulf. He's king now. Right? And so, the implication is, a while later, Beowulf remembers. Oh yeah, Herdred's dead. That's how I got to be king. So what does he do? He befriended Eadils, the wretched exile. See, when Orla and Weston and their troops attack, they kill Hardred, and they kill Amund. Okay? So now, Eadils, the son of Otra, is still alive. And what does Beowulf do? He says, Eadils, come here. I got a plan. All right? Across the open sea, he gave support to the son of Otra with warriors and weapons. He wreaked his revenge with cold, sad journeys and took his life. He, Eadils, right, comes from Beowulf's home, essentially a land of the sails back across the sea, goes to Sweden, and kills Onola. And balance is restored. The forest is now at peace. Why? Because the proper person is back on the throne. He should have been king, but he was killed by his uncle. So, he does what? He gets his revenge. He kills his uncle for killing his lord and king and brother. His lord and king and father. All right? But who took out Anmund? Weston took out Anmund. Okay? This is going to be important. And so the son of Edgethal had survived every struggle, every terrible onslaught with brave deeds, until one day when he had to take a stand against the serpent. Notice, until, meaning he ain't going to survive this one. So, grim and enraged, the lord of the gates took a dozen men to seek out the dragon. Beowulf and a dozen men. Does that suggest anything? One man and 12 followers. Jesus. He had found out by then how the feud arose. What feud? The feud between himself and the dragon. Okay. Somebody stole a cup from the dragon. So what does he do? He takes 12 men and... One more. Why one more? Who's the one more? Thief. So we have Beowulf plus 12 warriors plus one thief equals 14. Kind of love it. Okay. Pardon? Wasn't that his like, original? No, he, 15. 15. Beowulf and 14 others. Okay. But the thief is kind of really unimportant because, you know, as soon as he leads them to the barrow, he's going to hightail it out of there because he's not there to fight. Well, neither of these guys, really, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So what happens? The thief noticed against his will to where he alone knew the earth hall stood, that is the cave. And he takes them, shows them where the cave is. Inside, line 24, 12 and following, it was full of gems and metal bands. A monstrous guardian kept his gold treasures. And what happens? So they make their way. The hardened king sat down on the cape. Not like he's wearing a cape. It's like the cape like Cape Fear in North Carolina. And he wished good health to his hearth companions, the gold friend of the gates. So... They march their way there. They're on a headland. So, you know, it's something like this. And they're right at the edge of the headland. And they march down. And then Beowulf just kind of plops down here on the ground. And he goes, hey, good health, boys. Because <laughs> he is old by this point. And we're told his heart was grieving, restless, and ripe for death. He's thinking, what a way to go out, to take on a dragon. What did Hrothgar tell him in the homily? How can you die? 
sword, fire, flood, old age, illness, where the light of your eyes just kind of gradually dims. What's the way for a warrior to die? In battle with a sword in your hand. And if you can do it, fighting a monster, that's even better. Okay? And so he speaks. In my youth I survived many storms of battle, times of strife. I remember them all. I was seven years old when the Prince of Treasures, friend to his people, took me from my father. Okay? When the Prince of Treasures, friend to his people, about Greville. Beowulf was fostered by his grandfather. Okay? Now that could mitigate what I suggested earlier about when Hrothgar met him. It could be that Edgedale sent Beowulf to live with his grandfather because Edgedale had to leave. <laughs> he had to go into exile because of this feud that he had started. So, he says, Revel the king held me, kept me, gave me gems and feasts, etc. He says, I was no more hated to him while he lived than any of his sons. That's an odd way of putting that. I was no more hated by my grandfather than were any of his children. Hmm. Herobald and Hafkin and my own Helak. Herobald. Herobald. Hafkin and Helak. And then he's going to tell us a story about what happened when he was living with dear old granddad and Herobald, Hafkin, and Helak. Because he says, the eldest, Herobald, Undeservedly, a deathbed was made by the deeds of a kinsman after Hafkin, his brother, accidentally struck him down with an arrow. Now, almost everybody reads in this little passage that Beowulf is telling us a reference to a Norse myth, a Germanic myth, of Balder and Huther. Okay? Bal, Bal, Huth, Hath. Philologically, the two, these are related and these are related. In that Norse myth, Huther is tricked by Loki to shoot a piece of mistletoe at his brother Baldur. These guys are gods, by the way. Okay? Because Baldur cannot be slain. Unless you prick him with a piece of mistletoe. Okay? Yeah, I know. I mean, at least come up with something decent, like, like being shot in the ankle. Okay? So, Balder gets shot by Hother and dies. This leads to, this precipitates Ragnarok. Okay? The end of the world. Because when Balder dies, all hell breaks loose. Literally. <laughs> okay? Old Norse, hell breaks loose. <laughs> okay? So, Beowulf kind of brings that in. And so what does he tell us? Hafkin accidentally killed Herobald. Okay? So what does that mean? Ruthel has now got to exact justice on the killer of his son. But can he do that when the killer of his son is another son? He can't kill him. He can't really require wear guilt from him because what would it be like? It would be like giving your son 20 bucks to pay you back 20 bucks. That's not justice. So what happens? Hrethel dies of a broken heart. That was a fight beyond settling a sinful crime, shattering the heart. Yet it had to be that he lost his life unavenged. What have we just seen? A brother kills a brother. Accidentally, Unferth and his brothers, implication that Beowulf makes clear is that's not accidental. Grindel, Cain, Cain doesn't accidentally slay Abel. Okay? But still we see this idea of kin slaying at the heart of the poem. And it's repeated again and again and again and again. It's repeated with the Haramode episodes. It's repeated with the fight at Finsburg. 
So it is sad for an old man, 2445, to live to see his young son ride on the gallows, then let him recount a sorry, a strong, sorry song. So what does he do? Each and every morning, he thinks of his son's passing. What does that mean, each He's like that wanderer out on the boat. He wakes up, and what does he see? His son swinging on the gallows. Metaphor, literally, swinging on the gallows. It's an image of death. A son who shouldn't be dead, dead. This occupies his mind. So he dies of a broken heart. Fit 35. He takes to his couch, he keens a lament, all to seem the fields and townships, so the protector of the waiters bore surging in his breast heartfelt sorrows for Haribald. He could not in any way make amends for the feud. Nor could he hate that warrior, Hathkin. Okay? He can't make amends for his... But he also doesn't hate his second son. No. So the, far, the sorrow which befell him too sorely... Sorrow which befell him too sorely... He gave up man's joys. He chose God's light. He left to his children his land and strongholds. Blessed man does when he departed this life. That is, to these two, he said, I'm dividing the kingdom as it were, and dies. Then, that is, after Crevel dies, then there was strife between the Swedes and Gates. The implication is, the Swedes aren't going to try anything while old Hrethel's around. But it's not the Swedes who actually A quarrel in common across, across the wide water, hard hostility after Hrethel died, until the sons of Anya and Thal were bold and warlike, wanted no peace over the hill, but around the sorrows, Hresna Bear, in Old English, they carried out a terrible and devious campaign. My friends and kinsmen got revenge for those feuds and evils. Okay? That battle, however, was fatal for Hafkin, king of the gates. So, the Swedes attack, and what happens? He's already dead. Hafkin now dies. Just not a good time to be a king. And we're told the next morning, one kinsman avenged the other with the sword's edge when Anithiao attacked Elver, etc. I'm going to skip a lot of this. So, let's see here. Roth, uh, Beowulf says, line 2500 and following, um, that he slew Day Raven, champion of the Hugas. Okay. Tribes, that is the Hugas. Frankish tribes allude to the Frisians. The battle in question may be the same as Helak's fatal raid. It's usually taken that way. That is, Talk about here is not one between Anya Thal and the Swedes and the Gates. This is another battle going back to Helix Frisian raid. Hey Raven, okay, is the man responsible for killing Helix. In other words, before Beowulf swam away with the armor, what did he do? He avenged his lord's death. He killed. Helix, killer. All right? Then he takes the suits of armor and swims away. So, Babel finishes his speech and then starts speaking again on 2510. And says, I've survived many battles in my youth. It's the same thing he said back on 2426. It's kind of like he's old, he's forgotten what he's been saying, and so he kind of starts to repeat himself. Will yet seek out an old folk guardian, a feud, and do a glorious deed. If only that evil doer, doer will come out to me from his earth hall. Okay? He says, I will do one more glorious deed. If the dragon will come out. You know, what's the dragon doing? He's sleeping. Okay? Anybody know what the motto is of how? Never tickle a sleeping dragon. Why? They wake up. <laughs> okay. Never rouse a dragon. Okay. So, we're told for the last time he saluted each of the soldiers. 
And he tells them, bear a sword. I'd fight him the way I fought Grindel. But I expect the heat of battle flames there. So I will have shield. But he says, I won't flee a single foot. But for us it shall be at the wall as weird decrees the ruler of every man. What will be, will be. Whoever wins, that's God's choice. My mind is firm. I will forego boasting this flying one. Okay, if this is foregoing boasting, you really have to wonder what boasting would really look with Beowulf. Okay? And so what is he telling His 12 hand-selected warriors. Okay, now these are the best that he has. Yeah, I don't need you. You guys sit and watch. Okay? How long has Beowulf been king? 50 years. Okay? How many wars have they had in that 50 years? At this point, we've not been told. But after we bit by the dragon, we are going to be told. All right? Question? I was, just, I was confused about the like, they tell things happening after the dragon, or was something that was before. Which? When he, um, when he... When the two brothers were fighting the king... Hey, yeah, Wolf and Elver. Yeah. That's the passage we just went over. That's the passage dealing with Onyantel attacking Onyantel and his boys attacking these guys. Okay, that was bef that was actually long in the past. Okay. So, what does he do? He stands up by his shield. He trusted the strength of the sing of a single man, that is himself. And we're told. He goes near the horde, and line 25, 50 and following, he goes to the opening of the, of the and he yells at the dragon, you dirty, rotten, son of a snake, slime, loving, whatever. The sound entered and resounded under the gray stone, we're told, 25, 55, hate was stirred up. The horde warden recognized the voice of a man. Now, the old thing was just if it's that the dragon just heard the voice of a man and got angry, or because the word that is used can also mean this, the dragon understood the voice of a man, and he realized that this guy just called his mother, whatever. It is that the dragon understands human speech. Dragons don't normally understand human speech. Unless maybe they were which is another reason why Ray Tripp thinks the dragon was the last survivor. So what happens? Beowulf and the dragon fight. They come together three times. Beowulf's not doing so well. And then we're told, 25-6, his comrades, hand-chosen sons of noblemen, did not take their stand in a troop around him with warlike valor. They fled to the and saved their lives, except for one. One man stands up, okay? The prince of the Shieldings, kinsman of Alphara, he saw his liege lord suffered in heat, okay? Talks about the way mundings and such, and what does he do? He gets a sword, meaning wood, grabs his little wood, uh, not short, sword, shield, grabs his little wood shield, and he runs off to Beowulf. Wood shield, Dragon flame. Not a very good mix. Right? And we're told, 26, it was known among men, that is the sword, as the heirloom of Anmund. The sword that Wheelof wields was Anmund's. Okay? The son of Othra, that friendless egg in battle with the edge of a sword by Weston, who brought to his kinsmen the burnished helmet, the ringed birney, the giant work sword. And Onala gave to him the war equipment of his young kinsmen. In other words, Weston killed Anlin, and then he went to him and said, here's the sword, shield, birney of your dead nephew. And Onala said, well done, thou grateful servant. Keep it. It's your reward. Talk about dispensing treasure. 
Okay? He never spoke of a feud, though he had slain his brother's son. That is, who? Look at your footnote. Onola never spoke of a feud, though Weston had killed Onola's brother's son, for he wished him dead. Okay. In other words, there was this feud between Onola and his brother's son. He, Weston, kept that war gear for many years until his boy could perform brave deeds. In other words, give it to his son. This is the first time we're told Wheelof is wearing the sword in battle. He's never right. Okay? So keep in mind, Wheelof has Aemon's war gear. It's going to be important for the poem. And so Wheelof goes and he stands next to Beowulf and whispers in his ear and he gives him a long speech, but what does he speak? essentially mean. Suck it up, Beowulf. You're Beowulf. You're losing. What are people going to say? And Beowulf's like, oh yeah, I forgot. <laughs> okay. And so Beowulf takes his sword and we're told line 2680 uh, back up, 2677, the battle king remembered his glory and with his mighty strength swung his war blade with savage force and that struck in the skull. It was going for. He's going for the decisive blow. All right? And nailing means nails. That's a good name for a sword. Shatters. Why? Because Baal's too pick and strong. Okay? What it never works. In fact, the only time he kills a human in the story is when he kills Day Raven. And how does he kill Day Raven? He squeezes him to death. Okay? That's kind of dangerous. not how you normally would kill someone in a warrior society. Anyways, we're told it was not granted to him that I weapons might ever help him in battle. His hand was too strong. And so what happens? He hits the dragon on the head and he just kind of really angers the dragon. So the remembering his feud, rushed on the brave men, hot and bloodthirsty. And when he saw the chance, he sees Beowulf by the neck. Bites him right, you know, there. And I can, I can never find this article, but it, first or second year I was teaching here, I read an article about neck bites and pride in the Middle Ages kind of a thing. Because I was teaching Beowulf and I was teaching this book by Madeline Lingle at the same time where a guy gets bit on the neck. And the article was, you know, whenever someone is bit on the neck, it's an indication of pride on their part. Okay. What was he going for? He went for the killing blow. He went for the head. What comes out of the head of a dragon? A couple of things. Fire teeth. In other words, that's the part you stay away from if you're smart. You know, unless you're a professional herpetologist, if you are a professional herpetologist and you're out in the wild and you're gathering, you know, uh, eastern rattle, do you go up to the head to pick them up? No, you go to the tail. Because you can pick them up from by the tail and hold them like this, and unless they're eight foot long, they can't hit they can't bite you, okay? Because they can only go about half the, their body length, all right? I don't advocate trying this. <laughs> what does Beowulf do instead? Okay, the dragon's 50 feet long. He goes straight for its head. Can this be compared to the, like, Thor and the Oh, yeah. Because I'm pretty sure Thor would have that, too. Yeah. And they kill each other. Yeah, well, yeah, Thor definitely <laughs> would, because Thor definitely has a pretty big head. Um, so, blood gushes down in waves, and what are we told? What does Wheelof do? Like, I'm not going for the head. He goes a little bit farther down, and he stabs the dragon, we're told. The brave man's hand was burned so that he struck the savage foe a little lower down, the soldier in armor, so that his sword plunged in, bejeweled and bloody, so that the fire began to subside afterwards. Wheelof hits the dragon. He puts out the pilot light. 
I mean, there's got to be a place in the dragon that starts the flame. He puts it out. All right? So that then Beowulf takes his sword, and what does he do? He cuts the dragon in two. All right? And we're going to skip a bunch. Uh, line 2707. They felled their foe. Their force took his life. Brought him down, the two noble kinsmen. But it was Beowulf's last work of victory. When the wound which the earth dragon had worked on him began to burn and swell, he soon that he had an evil force in his breast, that his poison was moving. And he sat down on a seat by the wall. So apparently, here's the burial mound. Here's the opening, and the dragon has a nice little bench over here where it can, you know, sit out in the evenings and look at the sunset over the ocean. <laughs> That's the picture that the poet gives us, okay? I mean, there's a bench there. <laughs> and what happens? Beowulf speaks again, okay? Beowulf looks at the work of giants. Notice what? Stone arches. Stan boga is the old English word. All right? The reason this is significant is because the Anglo Saxons and the Celts before them did not build stone arches. If you go to some of the surviving barrows today that you can't actually go into because there are some, you have this big mound. And you'll have two upright stones with a lintel on top, like Stonehenge. You don't have stones that look like this. You don't have golden arches. Because only one people in the ancient world built with arches. The Romans. And here you have stone arches. Building arches out of stone isn't easy. You have to understand and the physics. Okay? You have to put that keystone first and get all the other stones in place. So this tells us something about where the Lord is. It's not up in Denmark. It's not in Sweden. It could be in Anglo-Saxon England because there are some burial mounds and natural arches. So, Baal speaks despite his wound and he says, if I had a son, I'd give him all my work here. Implication, therefore, clearly is he doesn't have a son. And then he tells us, I held this people 50 winters. There was no folk king, not any of the tribes, who dared to face me with hostile forces or threaten fear. So, for 50 years that he's been king, how many battles have, it, have his people been in? Zero. And so he picks his 12 best warriors. Madeline? Yeah, how does he know they're his best ones? Because they went out with wooden swords and practiced for 50 years? How good of warriors can you have if they never fight? Really fight, to the death fight. Because you wouldn't practice to the death. It'd be kind of self-defeating, right? So Beowulf is a mighty warrior. But all these guys are untested. All right? The decrees of fate I earth. I held well what was mine. The decrees of fate I awaited on earth. Meaning, Beowulf responded. He never initiated actions. Okay? I held well what was mine. Different is Beowulf from Shield. He's polar opposite. What does Shield do? Shield doesn't wait for fate. Shield makes his fate. He goes out, he expands his kingdom, he terrorizes his neighbors, he seizes their meat alls. I sought no intrigues, nor swore many false or wrongful oaths. The many false or wrongful oaths, it's litotes again. What does he mean by many? None. He didn't get involved in any palace intrigues, in other words. Before all that, I may have joy, though sick with mortal wounds. Why? Because the ruler of men need not approach me with the murder of kinsmen. 
he seems to be saying, I didn't get involved in any kind of palace intrigues, and I didn't get involved in any foreign battles, so that I would kill any relations. Okay? Now go quickly. Look at the hoard, Wheelof, so that I can see the ancient wealth, those golden goods, so that I could die more easily. He seems to be saying, bring out a bunch of treasure so that I can die with my eyes blazing over all this gold and these gems. But it's not that. So, the son of Westan goes into the horde, and he sees just a ton of stuff. Flagons, ancient serving vessels, okay, helm and rusty, armbands, twisted ornaments, right? He sees an ensign, he sees light, okay? Again, you know, the dragon likes has a nice little domestic, you know. No sign of the serpent, etc. And so he brings this out, and he wants to see whether or not Beowulf is still alive. And he finds Beowulf. Uh, and he began once more to sprinkle water on him. So when Beowulf first sits down, Wheelof kind of revives him by washing his face. This is the second time he revives him. And Beowulf again speaks. You just can't shut him up. He's like Bottom in Midsummer Night's Dream, when he's supposed to be dead. And he keeps For all these treasures, I offer thanks with these words to the eternal Lord, King of glory, for what I gaze upon here. Why? That I was able to acquire such for my people. Beowulf doesn't say, thank you, God, that I got all this glorious treasure for myself. Now bury it with me, because it's mine. He doesn't do that. He's thankful to God that he was able to get all this treasure for his people. Why? He thinks this will enrich the game. Now that I've sold my old lifespan for this hoard of treasures, they will attend to the needs of the people. Okay? So, tomb for me, he says. It will be a monument to my people, tower high in Wales Head. Even though he says it will be a monument to my people, it's, it's not going to be named the Gaitish People's Barrow. It's going to be named Beowulf's Barrow. All right? So he takes off from around his neck. Probably a torque, okay, which is a Celtic kind of thing, more than Germanic, which is a symbol of kingship. Beowulf takes it off and he puts it on Wheelof. Tell your king after me. Why? Beowulf doesn't have any direct heir. He does, however, have a cousin. A relation in Wheelof. Because Wheelof, as we're told, you are the last survivor of our lineage, the Waymundings. Fate has swept away all of my kinsmen, earls, and their courage to their final destiny. I must follow them. And every time I read that, and I've been for 20 years, I am reminded of a passage from an American novel of the early 19th century. Anybody know which one? Made into a great film with Daniel Day-Lewis. Last of the Mohicans. When Uncas dies, stand with Nanny Bumpo there on the mountain. And Uncas and Chingachgook says, you know, I am the last of my tribe. Those, you know, Uncas. And he essentially said, now I alone will go to my fathers, etc. And there's this theme runs throughout English literature from here all the way up through Last Mohicans, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, etc. And it's this idea of the last survivor of one's people. Think of how Moby Dick opens. Call me Ishmael. Why? Because he's the last one. Okay? So, Beowulf dies. His final thought before he chose surging flames, from his breast flew his soul. Okay, now, this isn't Beowulf telling us this. This is our poet telling us this. That Beowulf's soul flew to seek the judgment of the righteous. Okay, and then Leusa gives us this little footnote. Literally, the dome. Fame of the truth fast. An ambiguous pronouncement. 
does that because he doesn't want to be seen as directing the reader's interpretation. Okay? And probably he doesn't want a bunch, my terminology, a bunch of wackos coming at him saying, come on, Roy, you're making the poem too, quote, unquote, Christian. That's what the poem is. It is a Christian poem. And when the poet says, I didn't bring my old when the poet says he went to seek the South Fast, there is no other interpretation possible. The righteous. He went to seek the judgment of the righteous. That doesn't mean where the righteous will be pronouncing judgment. It means to be going with the righteous who have received judgment. And because they're righteous, what kind of judgment have they received? Heaven. Beowulf's a pagan. So what's the poet saying? Not all pagans are pagan. <laughs> or not all pagans are condemned to hell. Go back to what the poet said in line about 80, 185, 188. There are those who can what? Seek the open embrace of the Father after death day. Okay? So, then it came to pass with piercing sorrow, the young warrior had to watch Beowulf dies. And we get a long passage about the dragon, which we're going to skip. And then the men who fled to the woods, they kind of start creeping out. What does Wheelof say to them? You're screwed. <laughs> Why? You guys are cowards. Look what he says. Uh, 2864. He can say, oh yes, who would speak the truth that the Leisure Lord gifts of treasures, the military gear, that you stand in there, blah, 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 that he what? He threw them away. That is, threw away those war treasures when he gave them to you. Why? Because you didn't stand with them. Well, what did Babel tell them before the battle? It's not your battle. It's my battle. You guys sit and watch. Okay. Duty to one's Lord means duty to follow one's Lord's wishes. But you never let your Lord die alone in battle. That's kind of a supreme overarching given in that whole Germanic. We love steps up. So he tells them, as a result of your actions, you're going to lose everything. I'm the new king in town. You've lost your land. You've lost your property. You've lost your belongings. Go. Run away now. Flee into exile. Death, 2890, is better for any earl than a life of dishonor. And he kind of makes it clear. I'm going to make everybody know that you guys are dishonorable. So... He sends a messenger back to the battle camp, or to the edge, where the troop of Earl shield bearers sat, sat, sat sad-minded. In other words, even though Beowulf only brings these guys, we have a large following that comes part of the way. So let's say, you know, we've got land over here. There's a big group over here, and then a smaller group, okay? Smaller group of 11. And then we get Beowulf plus one. Is there any recognizable pattern? Well, it is very much like Christ and the disciples. Because he has this great big huge group of disciples. He has the 70. And then he has the 12. And then he has Peter, James, and John. And then at the crucifixion, what does he have? John. Okay. So you have the same exact pattern applied here. Okay? So, Wheelof sends word, and this messenger goes back to the gates and tells them this. Beowulf's dead. Dragon's dead, too, so that's, you know, kind of a good thing. What else? Um, 2911. Now this folk may expect a time of trouble. When this is manifest to the Franks and the Frisians, and the fall of our king becomes widespread. In other words, when word gets out that Beowulf's dead, what's going to happen? 
In Northern Europe, all hell is loose. Because who has problems with the gates? Everybody. Everybody. The Frisians are still pissed off because he like invaded them. Okay. The Hugas are not all that hank happy, who are also tribe of the Frisians. What else? The Swedes are not in a happy mood because who's now on the throne of Sweden? Dead. Dead. He's over here. He's now king here. Dead. dead. Oh, yeah. Anagils is still alive. Anmund's brother? Remember Anmund? Who killed Anmund? Yes. We lost daddy. So, Wilaf is now walking around with daddy's sword and armor, and Anmund has got to exact revenge. What? His brother's slayer, or his brother's slayer's son. Okay? So the Swedes have got a fight, too. Yeah, uh, oi! <laughs> Okay, so he says, what's going to happen? Line 29-25. It's been well known that Anyantau go back. <laughs> we go back way back. Anyantau ended the life of Hafkin. Okay, Anyantau kills Hafkin. Why? Not just because, you know, it's, he has nothing better to do on a Sunday afternoon. No, there's a reason. Reason. Because the ancient father of Othra, old and terrifying, returned the attack, the old warrior cut down the sea captain, that is Hathkin, rescued his wife, left of her gold. Which you can read that with some innuendo. Hathkin attacked Anthel. He kidnapped his wife and deprived her of her gold. Now, that could mean literal gold. Or it could mean he raped her, which would be a pretty good reason for the king to fire back with everything he has. Okay. Anyantau comes, he attacks Hafkin, Helak is now suddenly king, and what are we told in the next few lines? Helak, horn and trumpet are heard, charge, it's the cavalry. They come over the hill, Anyantau and his men die, that's pretty much what's in Fit 41. Okay. That's the stuff about Wolf and Elver that Brian asked me about earlier. Okay. So, line 2999. That is the feud and fierce enmity, savage hatred among men that I expect now. Wolf's dead. Uh, we were better off when Beowulf was alive and the dragon was sleeping. Because now we don't have Beowulf to protect us. Or do we have anyone that knows how to fight? Nor do we have anyone who knows how to fight. Okay? When the Swedish people seek us out, etc. Tori, look upon our people's king. Go with him who gave us rings on the way to the pyre. In other words, clock's ticking. We better get him burned and buried quickly. We can prepare for war. Okay? But the poet makes clear, or the messenger makes clear, let no warrior wear treasures for remembrance, nor no fair maiden have a ring ornament around her neck, but sad in mind, stripped of gold, she must walk a path, not once but often. In other words, the women are going to become slaves, and the men are going to be slaves. Thus many a cold morning shall the spear be grasped in frozen fingers, hefted by hands, nor shall the sound of the harp rouse the warrior, but the dark raven. Thus that brave speaker was speaking a most unlovely truth. He did not lie much in words or facts. Much lightities. He didn't lie at all. Interesting little factual tidbit. At the time that Beowulf is composed, whether it's a 700 AD or 1000 AD, well, let me take that back. The Beowulf is set roughly the 6th century, the gates were a real people. It was a tribe. People knew about them. They were, they were mentioned in histories. By 1000 AD, 
They're gone. And I mean gone, gone. Gone to the point that today we don't know exactly where they lived. We think it's in southern Sweden, in what is now called Gotland, G-O-T-L-A-N-D, and that the got relates to gate. Probably doesn't, philologically speaking. Well, what happens to them in the poem? Wiped off the face of the earth. And in history, gone. Okay? So, they make their way to Hrun, uh, Hrunas Nest, to the whale's head, the, the, the cape. They build this big funeral pyre. They put Beowulf's body on it. They load it up with all the treasure. Okay? All the treasure out of the barrow, and then they light it. What did Beowulf think the treasure was going to be good for? It's going to help his people. And melt all the gold and silver together, and then they put it in the barrel, and they bury it. Forty-two. Go down to thirty seventy-six. Got a few minutes left. Wheelof speaks. Often many earls must suffer misery through the will of one man, as we have now seen. What? What has he just said or implied? We're going to suffer misery because of the will of one man. Is this, you know, Wheelof paraphrasing Adam, uh, paraphrasing Paul, as in Adam one ought to die, and so in Christ all shall be made alive? No. He's saying, because of the will of one man, the cupbearer, the thief, possibly, Beowulf, possibly, we could not persuade our dear prince, shepherd of a kingdom with any counsel, that he should not greet that great let him lie where he had long been. He's just told us, and again, there are a lot of Anglo-Saxon scholars who want to kind of gloss over this line. He's just told us, we tried to dissuade Beowulf from going after the dragon. But no, no, no. He had to wake the dragon and go fight the dragon. So what's going to happen as a result? We are all going to die. The way to go, Beowulf. So he goes on. The horde is open, grimly gotten. Fate was too great. I was there. Let the beer be made ready. Okay. They summon the things. The guys ride around the burial mound. They sing their little dirge. And then we're told about them placing the... Uh, I skipped the passage. Where was it? Uh, bottom of page 86, left-hand column, talking about the dragon. They take care of the dragon and everything, then they pull all the treasure out, and we're told that as if in the bosom of the earth they had lain there for a thousand winters. Well, that's because they had. Before the dragon came, the treasure was 700 years. All right? Then the dragon comes, and then he lays there another 300 years, and then is awakened. All that inheritance, 3051, was deeply enchanted. The gold of the ancients gripped in a spell. Well, what was the spell? No man in the world would be able to obtain or hold unless God himself appointed it. So the $64,000 question becomes, did God appoint Baal or Wheelof to take the treasure out? Because if he didn't, everybody who touches it is condemned. And we're told, everybody goes in to pull all the treasure out. Okay? I think it's pretty clear from the poem, Wolf was given approval, let's say, to take the treasure. But notice what they do with it. They put it back into the earth. Why? Because ultimately, what does treasure buy you? Nothing. They put it back ultimately where it belongs in the ground, in the earth. Okay? And then you get the conclusion of the poem where we hear what Beowulf is like. They praise his judgment, they praise his power, they praise his prowess, and we're told said, line 3180, that he was of all the kings of the world, the mildest of men and the most gentle, the kindest to his folk, 
and the most eager for fame, mildest of men, most gentle, kindest to his people. On what basis can they make those three claims? What does he do to your reign? Peace. Yeah, there's peace. Have we had 50 years of peace in our United States history? No. I think the most longest peace we've ever had is like seven years. Other than that, we've been at war somewhere, everywhere. Because keep in mind, since 1952, technically we've been in a state of war with North Korea, even though it's a ceasefire. So during the 1970s, Vietnam's over, we're still technically in a state of war, right? But then you get that last line, most eager for fame. A lot of people say, oh, well, see, that's the Christian poet damning Beowulf. No, he's not. That's the Christian poet saying Beowulf is a good warrior. He wants to be known that he lived. He wants people to hear the name Beowulf after he dies. Okay? And he ends. Okay, the exam. Let me give you a quick idea or rundown of what it be. And I'll warn you right now, probably a lot of you won't do well on this exam. For the simple <laughs> man was like for the simple reason, okay, that you don't know what my exams are like. It's simply for that reason. I'm sure you'll know the material very well. Okay. By which I mean short answer, usually one word or more, okay, but not a paragraph. There won't be any essay. Um, short answer, there will be dates, you know, all that historical background, that... Definitely, in, you know, like the Germanic invasions, the Viking invasions, the coming of Christianity, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, anything that we read and passages that we discussed, which unfortunately is, you know, um, could show up. There will be passages to identify, so I'll give you quotes. But they won't be like, you know, I'm going to pull open the book and go, uh, when she had ruled over this monastery for some years, tell me, who is that speaking? It'll be a long passage. And what you'll be asked to identify could be the author, could be the title. Author's pretty easy. You only know one. All the others are, in, are anonymous. Okay, if you want to put down anonymous, that's fine. <laughs> um, author... Title, if it's a speech, okay, then who is speaking, okay, or maybe who is being spoken to. And it's pretty important to get those passages to look at things like pronouns, you know, because usually if there's a, you know, and she said to him, identify the him. If you give me Mary, I'm just going to think you're really stupid, okay, so don't do that. And believe me. The reason I say this is because I've had things like that. You have a masculine pronoun. I ask, you know, who is the referent? Who is the person being identified by the masculine pronoun? And I get a woman's name. Cross-dressing, transvestites, or anything like that in Anglo-Saxon poetry. Um, there might be some multiple choice. There might be some true-false, like two or three. Uh, and there will be... Probably minimum 15 points credit, maximum 30. And I often do that on my exams. Okay. They won't be easy, though. <laughs> I, I use for extra credit usually the stuff. I just can't find it in my heart to actually put on the exam. Um, <laughs> but I figure if you can get these, you, you um, most of it will be the short answer and identification. Okay. All right. That's all. Yes. No need a blue book. It'll all be on the exam.